Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, I hope you're, uh, you're all well. Uh, everyone can hear me okay? Excellent, thank you. We are a Tuesday, not, not Monday. Um, thanks to uh, thanks to all of you for uh, getting deliverable six in. Uh, most of you getting deliverable six in uh, on time. So I wanted to spend a few minutes this morning talking about uh, deliverable six and then deliverable seven before we uh, finish off our segment on uh, information spaces and then move on into our section on cognitive psychology. So let's talk about uh, deliverable six for the moment. Um, most common question, not surprisingly, is what happens at the end of uh, deliverable six if you have a KNN that is not predicting correctly on all the digits? The answer for now is that is perfectly fine. It should be predicting uh, at least on your two digits correctly. Um, if you've got to the end of six and your KNN was not originally predicting correctly on your two data sets, so either something wrong with your KNN or something wrong with the way you originally recorded your two data sets. Go back and have a look to make sure that's, uh, that's all correct. If your KNN was working just fine on your two data sets and as you added uh, data sets from other students, your KNN started to degrade in performance, that's perfectly fine. That is something you're gonna tackle in deliverable seven. Any questions about deliverable six before we move on and talk about seven? No? Okay. So uh, it is kind of interesting to scroll through the spreadsheet and sort of look for where the, the weak parts are uh, in our respective KNNs. I added a row at the bottom of the 10 digits tab, which shows the average performance of all of your KNNs by digit. So here's the average performance for all KNNs trying to predict uh, someone assigning 0, 1, 2, and so on. As you'll notice here, uh, all of our KNNs generally did a better job at predicting, uh, guess, at predicting correctly for digit 0 than the other 9 digits. Why is that the case? If you have an idea, go ahead and, and type it into chat. Why is it easier for our all of our KNNs to recognize the digit zero when it appears compared to recognizing the other digits? As Harry mentions, it's the most unique sign. It's the only one, exactly, it's the most distinct handshape. It's the only one where all of the fingers are clenched underneath uh, the palm, right? Everything else has at least one finger extended. If you'll remember back to when you were working with the iris data set, there were the red flowers, the blue flowers, and the green flowers. Blue flowers were close to, were similar to green flowers and vice versa, but red were more different from, from the other two. We see that exact uh, phenomenon appearing here in our system, which is again a good sanity check for all of us to make sure that we're on the right track. This is what we would expect a KNN to do. It's never going to predict perfectly, but we want it to do, uh, we want it to do pretty well on all of the 10 digits. You'll notice that some of the digits are more difficult than others, like 1 and 4, for example. Uh, I'm still not quite sure why 1 is so difficult. It's clearly not impossible. Some of you have managed to create KNNs that successfully recognize the digit 1 uh, and 4 and so on. Okay, so let's switch now and talk about deliverable 7. Actually, let me bring up the, the schedule again for a moment. Deliverable 7 is going to be the most challenging deliverable because you're going to have to add in more data to get your KNN to be a general predictor for all 10 digits. So um, I'm giving a one week extension on Deliverable 7. It will not be due next Monday the 19th. It will be due the following Monday uh, on October 26th. So you have two weeks to work on uh, Deliverable 7. Okay. So why is Deliverable 7 so challenging? Okay. 
Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to you're going to spend the first part of Deliverable Seven trying to improve your KNN's prediction for all digits. I've given some advice about how to do this here, but it is not uh, it, this is not a one size fits all set of uh, suggestions. Depending on your KNN and your hand and your particular subset of the data, you're going to have to implement various fixes to get your KNN to predict uh, predict well. Okay. So uh, let's scroll down. So you're going to spend a lot of time on steps uh, six. Uh, uh, Sorry, you're going to spend a lot of time on st steps five, six, seven, eight, and nine. In five, you're going to go back to that spreadsheet and find the digit for which your KNN is performing the worst. Um, Robert is asking, is there an attendance sheet for today? Is it not accessible? I thought it was. Uh, everybody, can everybody edit the attendance sheet? Yes, there it is. Okay, Robert, it's it's there. Okay, deliverable seven. Um, so in step five, in step five, you're going to find the digit for which your KNN is performing the worst, and you're going to focus on that digit for a while. First thing to do is go find a second uh, is to go find a second instance of that digit in the data set and add that to your training uh, function, your train function in predictgestures.js. Okay. Uh, you're going to have to expand the for loop to do so, to train on the original instance of that weakest digit that you already have in there, and then adding in uh, a second instance and perhaps a third, uh, and so on. Okay. However, as most of you have already figured out, just adding data from another student uh, may help, but it might also hurt. Um, you might be right-handed, they might be left-handed, or vice versa. Some of you have smaller hands or larger hands. Um, we are obviously not going to hold it against you if you are a lefty uh, or you have a smaller hand in this class. This is why uh, in deliverable six we were not, we will not deduct points for poorly performing KNNs. It may not be the fault of your KNN. It may be because of the size of your hand that you're a lefty, that you included data from a lefty, uh, and so on. We're giving a lot of time for Deliverable 7 for you to use what you've learned in this course to figure out what changes you need to be to balance out the data set and get your KNN to work uh, better. Okay. If you include another student's, uh, if you include another student's digit by following steps six through nine and it doesn't help, go back and do it again. Grab another student, add theirs into your training algorithm, and so on. There are. Um, plenty of instances of each digit for you to uh, choose from. Okay, continue that process until your KNN uh, can recognize your weakest digit uh, more than half the time. So, as I mentioned, we're not looking for a perfect KNN. What we want to see is that when someone signs the digit one over your KNN, it recognizes it. It recognizes it more than half the time as they move and rotate their their hand. Uh, David is asking, do we have to use a KNN or can we use another uh, ML algorithm? That's perfectly fine. Um, if you're uh, comfortable with machine learning, you can swap out the KNN and replace it with another machine learning algorithm. As I mentioned, you have two weeks for deliverable seven. So for those of you that uh, want to try something more ambitious, like using something other than a KNN, uh, or you want to try some other things, now's the time. You've made it through six of the ten deliverables, six down, four to go. It's a little bit of a breather here for some of you. Um, for others, you're going to spend the two weeks trying to get your KNN to recognize all ten digits. Okay. All right, so this is what we're looking for. This is the, this is the magic phrase here in step 11, that it recognizes more than half the time. Okay, so um, in my case, I added two links here. Uh, you can go look at this at your leisure. The first link here shows that my KNN originally did not recognize the digit one at all. Um, and then I added in some additional training instances of the digit one. And now it recognizes the digit one somewhat better, but it is still, uh, it is still not, not perfect. Okay. You'll notice if you watch my two videos that in my case at least, the improvement on one um, did not overly degrade the KNN's performance on the other digits. In my case, digits five through nine. That is not always the case. 
you may add in some additional data. Your KNN may get better at your weakest digit, but in doing so, its performance on the other digits will start to degrade, and you can obviously test that uh, as, you, as you go. Okay, so you're gonna spend a lot of time looping through steps six through uh, nine to get this to work for all your, your digits. As I mentioned, the first uh, plan A is add more instances of the digit. However, that might not work, so I've added a bunch of other suggestions uh, in step 11 here. So as you're trying to boost the performance of one of your digits, uh, if you exhaust all the instances in the data set, you use up all the data set, all the instances of that digit that are available, uh, you can then go back and record some of your additional data. That's, that's perfectly fine. Again, for some of you, you may have smaller hands and the, uh, much smaller than the mean hand size in the class and including just more larger hands may not help you, in which case it's okay if you go back and record additional data, um, uh, record some additional data of your own. Okay, another potential issue and a potential fix for this is that we used to teach this class in Python. Now we're teaching it in JavaScript. One of the nice things about JavaScript is it's highly optimized for browsers. And the result for us is that um, if you have a fast computer, you, uh, you should see that the animation is very smooth of your hand. And if the animation is very smooth, what that means is that the number of frames per second is very high. Remember that uh, your system is capturing frames of data from Leap and then drawing each of those frames. So if we're recording uh, 100 num samples, we're recording 100 frames of data into 100 3D tensors that are packaged inside one 4D tensor. If, for example, your system is running at 60 frames a second, then you've basically filled up all 100 tensors in a second and a half. If you're trying to sign a digit and you're trying to get it right and then you start moving it, by the time you start moving it, it may have already filled the 100 frames with your stationary hand and it missed you trying to orient, uh, to, to uh, rotate the hand. So this was something I, I, didn't re I didn't realize until we got to this point. No problem, we can, we can fix that. One thing you can do is if you want to record some of your own data, you can increase num samples from 100 to 200 to 300. So you're capturing more frames as you sign one of the digits. If you do do that, however, remember that you're going to have to make a change to your for loop in train to make sure that you're iterating over the uh, greater number of samples. If you're reading in data from other students, those are recorded at a num samples of 100. So you might have different training sets in train now, some of them that have length 300, some of them that have length 100. Uh, I'll leave it to you to figure out how to, how to handle that. Okay. Uh, the, other thing, uh, the other thing you can try to fix this is increasing num samples, as I just mentioned, but you can also try rotating your hand quickly to make sure that you're capturing lots of orientations inside 100 frames uh, of data. But of course, as you've noticed, you sometimes need to hold your hand steady or else you'll get garbage data. So it can be a bit of a challenge to train yourself to rapidly show your sign uh, and keep uh, to, to gesture your sign, rotate quickly and make sure that leap correctly infers the positions of the bones in your hand while you're doing that. So that might take a little bit of practice. You might have to do that two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. That's why we're giving you two weeks for this. Okay. For the lefties in the class, obviously you are at a disadvantage. It is harder to use uh, most of the other data in the class because the majority of students in the class are righties. You can fix this by uh, making your KNN uh, ambidextrous, meaning that it's agnostic to whether it's looking at a right hand or a left hand. So how does that work? Well, the minute that you uh, pull in a frame of data for training, you can flip it and turn it from uh, a right-handed, uh, uh, sorry, you can take a training instance that contains a gesture, a right-handed gesture, feed it to your KNN for training, and then before you repeat the for loop in uh, train, you can take that frame, 
pass it through a function that will flip it or mirror it into a left hand. Okay, how do you do that? Go back and have a look at the center x data function. Make a copy of it, call the new function mirror hand. And inside mirror hand, like in center x data, you're going to pull out all the x coordinates from the current tensor and change them to 1 minus x. So we're basically flipping all the x coordinates in the frame. And if you think about it, if you think about all the x coordinates um, of the bones in my hand at this moment, if we take 1 minus x, we get this, right? Remember values uh, of x range between 0 and 1. 1 minus uh, x is going to flip them. Um, even if you're a righty, you can do this. This, in essence, will double the size of your training data because for every instance, regardless, training instance, regardless of whether it's a right hand or a left hand, you can flip it from one to the other and then add that to your uh, add that to the training set for your KNN as well. Generally speaking, in past years, that's helped everyone, regardless of whether you're right-handed or left-handed. So um, you can kind of imagine where, we're, you can probably guess where we're going with this. We're implementing a bunch of um, uh, transformations here that make your KNN see all the data in more or less the same way. We're kind of normalizing the data. We've centered the hand. Um, we are mirroring the hand in this case. For those of you that want to work on this, there are other things you can do. You can uh, resize the hand. So have a look again at center X data, center Y data, and center Z data. You should figure out how to make duplicates of those functions and then modify them so that they scale the size of the hand. For those of you that are comfortable with geometry, you can also rotate the hand. You can take one of the 3D tensors and apply some, uh, apply some algebra and trigonometry to rotate the hand. That's all, that's all optional. Okay. All right, so when that's all working, you should have at the end of step uh, 12 here, you should have a KNN that's able to predict better than 50% on all 10 digits, and you're gonna record a video of your KNN doing exactly that upload it to YouTube at step 14. Any questions about that? No? Okay. As always, I suggest you start this early. Um, for some of you, you might already have a KNN that's doing pretty well and it won't take you very long to get through this. For others, depending on the size of your hand, depending on whether you're righty or lefty, depending on which subset of data you've collected, it might take much longer than that. Get started, get started early. Amanda and I will be available for office hours later this week, on Monday, next week, and so on. Okay, in the remainder, uh, in the remainder of deliverable seven, you're going to go back to do to doing some visualization work. You're going to break your uh, you're going to break your browser window into a series of four panels. You're going to alter the way you draw the virtual hand so that it's always drawn in just the upper left panel. You're going to take the coordinates of the hand and instead of scaling them between zero and window inner width and zero and inner height. You're going to be scaling those coordinates between 0 and inner width divided by 2, and 0 and inner height divided by 2, which will shrink the hand and keep it in the, in the upper left. You're then going to be adding some helpful illustrations um, in the upper right panel, where if someone puts their hand over the device and their hand strays too far to the right, there will be an image showing to move their hand back to the left. They move their hand back to the left, and if their hand drifts too far to the left, suddenly an illustration will pop up here indicating they should move their hand back to the center. Uh, two more illustrations. One, helping if they drift towards their body or away from their body, and a fifth and sixth vis visualization if they drop their hand too far down or too far up. So basically, a set of dynamic uh, warning illustrations that will pop up or guidance illustrations to make sure they keep their hand more or less centered uh, over the device. And you'll be drawing additional visualizations in the two lower panels uh, in deliverable uh, 8 and 9, respectively. And that's... Uh, 
That's all I wanted to say about Deliverable 7. Any questions about Deliverable 7? No? Okay. All right, so back to, back to lecture. Back to lecture. Uh, we are um, going to finish up uh, lecture nine in a moment and then dive into our first lecture on uh, cognitive psychology, which will be mental models. Just as a reminder, we're going to just touch on a few items from cognitive psychology that relate to HCI. We're going to start with some more objective ones like pre prediction and expectation and mental models and move to more subjective aspects of thinking like affect or emotion. Okay, so back to lecture nine, where we were uh, talking about information spaces. We introduced this idea of ontologies and taxonomies. Ontologies, ways to create new information spaces, and taxonomies, ways to structure those information spaces. And then we ended last time by starting to think about some of the characteristics of an information space. How do we start to add color and form and structure and direction to an information space? Uh, where did we get to last time? I think we got to uh, looking at, at media and visual, back to visual design. What are the various ways that we can create visual and auditory metaphors to create the illusion or basically create the illusion of the structure of this information space? We ended last time by watching this video from Johnny Lee where he, uh, he exploited not just, not just uh, what was drawn to the screen, but also the motion of the observer's head relative to the screen to convince the observer's brain that they were looking not at a two-dimensional screen, but that they were looking into a three-dimensional virtual space. Okay. We've talked about uh, coherent design uh, before. Um, if we are going to create visual analogies or, or metaphors in our system, we want them to be consistent across the entire space. If we are trying to advertise to our observer that they're navigating through an, a 3D space, then wherever they go in that space, smaller objects should indicate objects that are further away. If they move from one room to the next in your virtual 3D space, and in one room it's consistently projecting the illusion of three dimensions, but in another room that, that illusion is broken, obviously that's, that's very jarring and, and breaks, breaks the spell. Okay. More obvious aspects, standardized templates, simple and consistent color, color schemes, icon, uh, icons, iconography, and, and so on. Um, another thing that is sometimes exploited is repeating topological patterns. So uh, if you have a three-dimensional space, then there are usually about two or three branches from any one point. Um, so what is sort of the, the branching structure or the connectivity of your space? Does it, does it help the user understand what that space is and how to navigate it if you have a more or less consistent branching structure? If you think about uh, websites as information spaces, that is often not true. Some pages have more densely connected outgoing hyperlinks uh, than others. No, so these are not hard and fast rules, but just things to, to think about. Finally, if you have a complex enough information space, you may create bots or agents which themselves are able to observe that space and act on that space and move through that space and they themselves are moving through that space ultimately to support PACT, to support the people that are pr trying to perform activities uh, in that space. So these agents are you know, pieces of code or, or physical objects if we're talking about robots, if we're talking about a combined physical and information space. And these agents, whether they're virtual or physical, are able to perceive, move, and think about the sensory repercussions of their actions. They are able to push against the information space and observe how the information space pushes back. Right? So these could be things like avatars if we're talking about a virtual reality system or non-human AI agents. Why might we decide to deploy agents into an information space? Again, we want them to support activities. Um, usually they themselves are trying to organize the space to make it easier 
for humans to navigate that space. So you have librarian agents that go about and organize data or virtual objects in a virtual space into easy to recognize categories. You might have virtual ants or virtual agents that are moving about through a networked system along links and nodes and trying to find the shortest paths between, uh, between paths in that, in that system. Um, this is something that is actually used by telecommunications companies. So um, if you're looking at very complex and dynamic network traffic and um, the, the software is trying to compute what is the shortest path for a data packet to get from point A to point B, that shortest path may, may change from moment to moment depending on network traffic, uh, the changes in network traffic. So often telecommunications companies will create uh, will create software where the packets themselves are agents. They are moving and leaving information at each node in the telecommunication network as they go. And those agents were inspired by something that physical agents do, ants do all the time, which is ants and agents inside uh, a, a telecommunications network are trying to find the shortest path. In the case of the ants, they are trying to find the shortest path between their nest shown here in the center, and some food source out there in the world that is distant from their nest. Ants do not, ha uh, do not have a lot of brain power on board, so how can they exploit the fact that there are many of them to collectively find the shortest path? What many ant species do is uh, when they leave the nest, they will walk relatively at random. And if they get lucky, uh, and as they're moving at random, they are dropping a small chemical signature. They're leaving breadcrumbs as they go. And if they find a food source, they turn around and they follow their own uh, pheromone trail back to the nest. Other ants, as they're moving about, they're maybe also moving randomly, but if they happen to hit on the trail, the pheromone left by another ant, they will turn and start to follow that pheromone, um, uh, follow the strongest smell of that pheromone. What is the densest path of breadcrumbs of pheromone? If a lot of them are doing this, they will eventually create a shortest path between a food source and a nest. In this little cartoon example here, you can see in red, which is meant to represent the pheromone trails being constructed collectively by the ants, you'll notice this slightly longer path here is slightly paler than this shorter path here. So you can see them in the process of creating the shortest path. How does this simple algorithm that I just described, walk randomly, leave pheromone, if you find food, turn around, follow your own pheromone. If you don't know what to do, and you, if you're walking at random and you discover another pheromone trail, follow it. Why does that algorithm result in shortest path? What are, what's the physical context here? What, what happens that that algorithm being run by every ant in the colony, how does that lead to shortest paths? Why does over time this shorter path have an increasing concentration of pheromone, an increasing number of ants moving back and forth along this path compared to this longer path? These ants can't ne necessarily measure distance. They, don't, they can't tell which is the longest path, but they collectively reinforce the shortest path more than they reinforce the longer path. Why is that the case? Uh, as Evan mentioned, pheromones, because they're chemicals and they're a small amount of chemical, they, they decrease, they diffuse and degrade over time. So a longer path will fade faster because ants are more spread out. Exactly. So even if the same number of ants initially find both paths, we have the same number of ants moving along both paths, as Evan mentions, 
assuming they're distributed uh, evenly, there will be uh, there will be greater distances between ants on the longer path than the shorter path, meaning that there is less reinforcement of pheromone. So we get more reinforcement on the second path. So an ant, a new ant that uh, emerges from the nest and is trying to quote unquote decide which path to follow, will tend to will tend to follow the path that has higher pheromone. Meaning now the ants are not distributed evenly. Now we have even more ants moving along this shorter path, uh, and so on. Turns out that you can write a simulation of a of an ant nest with maybe a hundred lines of code, it's not that difficult to do. For those of you that are interested in these kinds of ideas, it's a fun thing to actually try and simulate one of these. Turns out ants aren't the only ones that collectively, uh, that collectively and in some cases unconsciously, create structure in their environment simply by the fact that they move through this environment. Here on campus, um, when we have the first snowfall, in the before times at least, when we were all walking across campus, we would also collectively create shortest paths between buildings. How? Exactly. So we all leave footprints uh, in the snow. Most of us are running late for class, as always. So we make a beeline from our dorm uh, or the parking lot to uh, the building where our classroom is. We want to follow the shortest path. So does everybody else. There are a lot of people in your dorm who are also going to the same building at the same time for the same class or a similar class. So we typically don't pack down all the snow on campus. We create these paths because we're all heading in more or less the same direction, which has to do with the social context surrounding uh, a university. Uh, I, would I always invite classes to, to go outside and view this process during the first deep uh, snowfall. Obviously things are different this year. It'll be interesting to see whether these paths emerge or what they look like um, with social distancing in effect. So for those of you that are uh, on campus this semester, please uh, someone get a photo and, and drop it into chat here when we have the first snowfall. It'll be interesting to see what that, what that looks like. Okay, um, most of you probably heard of the Waze app, right, which shows where traffic, uh, where traffic is, um, which again relies a bit on this idea that we have a whole bunch of people that are driving and they, assuming they turn on the permissions on their, uh, on their phones, they are, vir they are uploading virtual pheromone to the Waze server, which stitches it all together. And with relatively little effort, assuming that everyone is reporting their path and their speed of travel along that path, we can, Waze can very quickly determine for a given ant, a, given, a new driver, what's the shortest path between point A and point B. Okay. That concludes our discussion of the various characteristics that make up an information space. It also concludes our discussion of, uh, it just, uh, finishes our discussion of information spaces and this very long section on interactive systems design. So take a, take a deep breath and we're gonna switch mental gears now and focus exclusively for the moment on humans. Throughout our uh, four lecture series on cognitive psychology, I want you to keep one main fact at the front of your brain, which is that brains are prediction machines. If you put a leap motion device in front of a, a friend or family member, they may passively look at it, but eventually they will reach out and try and interact with it in some way. And whether they're aware of it or not, they will have a prediction or an expectation about what's going to happen. Regardless of whether that expectation is met or frustrated, that is material being given back by the world, in this case your interactive system, about what, what they should do next. Assuming they wanna help you and they wanna actually learn ASL with your system and help you get a good grade in this class, they will be trying to do things to get the system to react and they're gonna use that feedback loop of pushing against the world and observing how the world pushes back. 
to learn how to use your system, to learn how to learn ASL, and help you get a good grade in this class. Okay, so let's start and have a look at how this process works. In order to make predictions, we need to have something that is the thing that is making the prediction, and that is the mental model. Okay. So to introduce this concept of mental models, we're gonna step away from humans and HCI for a moment, and we're gonna look at a robot instead. This is a robot that I helped build uh, and test uh, about 10 years ago. The, uh, this particular robot, the starfish robot, um, what it was built to do is it is going to create a mental model. It is not going to create a mental model of the lead motion device or something out there in the world. This robot is actually going to start by creating a mental model of self. One of the first things that human babies do, and probably most higher animals do when they are born, is they need to form a mental model of themselves because they need to be able to use that mental model to make predictions about potential actions in the world. They need to be able to internally rehearse actions using a simulation of themselves, a mental model of themselves, because a lot of the actions you can make in the world, especially when you're young and not experienced with, with the world itself, are dangerous actions. Imagine you have an organism or a robot that is standing on the edge of a cliff, and the robot feels curious and places a foot over the edge of the cliff. It performs an action. No mental model, no prediction about what will happen, just act and let's see what happens. Clearly that is an extremely dangerous thing to do and there is great evolutionary pressure against doing things like that. Imagine another organism which has a mental model of self. It can sort of run a simulation of itself. It is standing literally at the edge of a cliff, looking at the cliff, and thinking to itself, running its mental model to say, if I take another two or three steps forward, what will happen? Right? Um, there's a famous saying about mental models, which is that they allow those models to die in our stead. Okay, so you know, again, how is this relevant for, for HCI? We are, we, from birth, we spend a lot of our time pushing against the world and observing how the world pushes back and using that to build mental models and then turning around and using those mental models to predict what would happen if I did this, to internally rehearse actions before, before performing them in real life. Okay, how humans do this and what these mental models in the human brain actually look like is currently unknown. So that's one of the reasons to work with robots. We can do this in a much simpler way and literally see what the robot is thinking at every point in time. Okay, so let's have a look at this robot. Uh, this robot starts its life with no mental model of itself. However, we give it a few hints. We tell this robot here that it's made up of these nine parts. The robot itself has two tilt sensors on board. So the main body of the robot, when the robot moves, the tilt sensor will say how much the main body is tilting left and right. It'll return one number, negative 30 degrees, plus 23 degrees, plus 67 degrees, and so on. Second sensor will tell how much the robot's body is tilted forward and back. So for every action, for every action, every time the robot pushes against the world, it gets back two numbers. How much did I tilt left and right, and how much did I tilt forward and backwards? We're gonna limit this robot not to walking or dancing or moving around. It's going to basically just start flat and then move to another position, and then look at those two numbers. Okay, so very, very simple actions and very, very simple sensory repercussions. This robot has no camera, it can't see itself, so it doesn't know its own shape. It doesn't know how it's put together. It knows that these nine pieces are connected in some way, but there are an infinite number of ways in which these pieces can be connected together. So these three cartoons that you see down here, these are three potential mental models that the robot could construct. Clearly all three are wrong. So far so good? Okay. Okay. So how does this... Uh-oh. We don't have a video here. I'll have to go looking for it on YouTube in a moment. That's fine. So uh, how does the robot build a mental model? How does it start to construct hundreds or thousands or millions of these mental models? And how does it start to distinguish between those that are correct and those that are uh, incorrect? 
So uh, let's let's let me just go find these for a moment. Okay. So the robot has no idea about the mental model. So what does it do first? Uh, it it performs randomly. So as I mentioned, it starts lying down. It starts lying down and moves to a random position. And in that random position now, uh, it records those two numbers, how much it's tilted for left and, and right and how much it's tilted forward and back. Okay. You'll notice uh, if we, let's see, I don't know if I can loop this, I'll just do this manually. This robot has eight motors, one at the shoulder and one at the elbow in each of the four legs. So we have a total of eight motors. And so it's basically sending eight numbers to these eight motors about how much to rotate the motor. So eight numbers for an action, and for those eight numbers, it gets two numbers back. Amount of tilt left and right, and amount of tilt forward and back. Okay, so the robot has one experience from the real world now. It had to act randomly because it doesn't have a mental model. It can't predict yet. And let's see here. Uh, I think I'm missing one here. Oh, thank you, thank you, David. Okay, this is fine, we'll go with this. Okay, so uh, now the, ro the physical robot lies flat and it's going to now, instead of acting, it's gonna think. It's going to try and find mental models that match the experience that it just had. It produced these nine actions and it rotated, the main body rotated a little bit forward. What you're seeing in this video, uh, view loop. There we go, thank you, David. Okay, so what you're seeing in this video is the robot going through many, many models one after the other. At the beginning, it's generating these models at random. It's taking these nine pieces and putting them together at random. For each one of these mental models that is flashing by, it takes the same eight numbers that it sent to the physical motors and sends it to the eight virtual motors. So in each of these, the robot is put together in different ways, but you'll notice that relatively quickly, the robot uh, realizes that if these pieces are put together in a certain way, the body will tilt in their correct direction. In the video that I showed you with the physical starfish, the body tilts about 30 degrees forward and in the virtual world here the body is tilting about 30 degrees to the left that's simply because I'm not a very good camera person I should have shot this the camera is actually pointing should be pointing this way the robot is tilting 30 degrees uh, 30 degrees forward okay so let's jump back to uh, the slide for a moment so basically for each mental model like this one here the robot as it's sifting through all these different uh, mental models it can assign a score it can as assign a single number to each mental model which is how good is that mental model how accurate is it how how good is it at matching my experience and I've tried to visualize this here with this picture. We have these eight motor commands that come in that dictate what angle the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight motors should rotate to. And we get two numbers back. We take, we take the virtual robot, we send the same eight motors, and we get two virtual sensors, sensor values back. The quality of or the accuracy of a mental model is how close the physical sensor data matches the virtual sensor data. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay, let's have a look at this video again. You'll notice that in this video there are actually many mental models 
that the robot can generate where the green box is tilting 30 degrees to the left, or if I put the camera in the right place, 30 degrees back. So the robot is a little confused at this point. It says, I wonder if I'm put together like this, and the mental model says, yes, that seems correct. And then it says, well, the robot says, well, what if I put myself together in this different way? And that mental model says, yes, that's also correct. I can produce the same virtual sensor data for the same set of actions. So the robot's confused at this point. If you were the robot, what would you do next? The robot isn't that smart, but it knows that it can't be built like this, and built like this, and built like this, and so on. So what should the robot do? It can't distinguish between all these different mental models. The robot is trying to converge on the one correct description of how it's put together, but it can't seem to make any progress. So as Khan says, the robot is asking the question, which one is most accurate? At the moment, given the fact that the robot performed this random action and got these two sensor values back, there are many mental models that seem to be equally accurate. But that can't be true. There can only be one that's accurate. So what should the robot do next? As Luke mentions, the robot can think all it wants. It's not sufficient. The robot has to stop thinking and go act in the world. It needs to perform a new action, which it does. So as we saw before, the robot did this. It got a bunch of these models. So then the robot went and did, uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, it's going to take me too long, I think, to find another one. OK, the robot went and performed. Actually, uh, I think I, I can just play this for you. Here we go. Uh, OK. This is the entire video. I can skip around a little bit. OK, here's the robot performing the random action. Then it thinks for a while. And after that single action, it finds a bunch of these mental models that all rotate forward correctly. So the robot stops. And as Luke mentions, this robot performs a, a second random action. With that second piece of data, it's still, uh, each of these, uh, with that second action, or actually I've skipped ahead now, it's actually performed eight actions. With these eight actions, it's taking each mental model, like this one, feeding in the first set of eight motor commands, getting two numbers back, and seeing how close that matched the, the experience of the robot during the first action. Then it takes the second action, the second set of eight motor commands, sends that to the robot, gets two sensor values back, and compares the virtual sensor data against the physical data from this one. So it's basically animating or running this mental model eight times, given the eight actions that the physical robot has already performed. And the score of this mental model still collapses down to a single number, which is how well this simulated robot was able to match all eight, uh, all eight actions. And as you'll see at this point, after, the, after eight actions, the robot starts to converge on a correct description of self. It's getting pretty close. It repeats this process 16 times. Perform an action, generate some mental models, perform a second action, uh, refine those mental models, make changes to them so they increase that score and the virtual sensor data starts to approach the physical sensor data. And after 16 cycles, this is the robot's idea about how it's put together. The robot now has a mental model of itself. What I haven't mentioned, because this is not a robotics class, is how this robot is actually altering these mental models to get them to have better accuracy, to more closely match the physical sensor data. The robot does that by using a machine learning algorithm called an evolutionary algorithm. 
It's different from K&N. We don't have time to go into it at the moment. For our purposes, I want you to think about this machine, which is alter uh, alternately acting and then thinking. Act, think, act, think, act, think, and it's alternating to converge on a de description of self. It has a mental model. Your users, when they first encounter your ASL system, are gonna do something similar. They're gonna do something and see the screen react, think about what they see, and decide what to do next, and then see how the system responds, and through a number of those action and thinking cycles, hopefully your users will converge on a mental model and understanding of what that thing is and how it works. In this case, we have a machine which is doing the same thing, alternating thinking and acting, and creating a mental model. In both cases, the human and the robot, they're creating the mental model because they need it. They're gonna use it as a tool for something else. In your case, your users are gonna use their mental model of your system to efficiently learn ASL. In the case of our robot here, it's gonna use its mental model to rehearse potentially dangerous actions. So here, we now ask the robot, we said, we want you to figure out how to walk along the table. So Khan says, do they create new mental models by doing that? Um, so Khan has mentioned mental models, plural. As we can see in this robot, this robot is trying out lots of different mental models and converging on one mental model, which is an accurate description of self. When someone interacts with an unfamiliar object or system like your ASL educational game, is the human creating one mental model of the system as a whole? Do they have alternative mental models that are, that are competing? The, the user thinks, well, maybe it sees my hand. Um, maybe, uh, maybe when I put my hand over the device, it's not seeing the hand, but that triggers an animation of somebody else's hand. You can imagine someone have multiple guesses, multiple uh, mental models about what's going on, and they may do additional things to try and figure out which of those mental models is correct. At the moment, nobody knows. So um, neuroscience knows that there are mental models in the brain, but which mental mo mo what, are, what are those mental models? Where are they in the brain? What form do they take? Does a mental model span my interaction with the system. Do I have one mental model for my hand and another one for the system? And then do I have a larger mental model that combines the hand and this ASL system? Nobody knows. So um, are they creating new mental models, plural? Are they refining or improving a single mental model? In the case of humans, uh, we don't know yet. Does that answer your question, Khan? Or maybe you were asking about the robot. Okay. So even even though we may have to program for that robot, we didn't actually know if they create a new mental models or are they just trying to figure out what is the correct mental model for uh, each movement. I, I understand now. Okay, you're asking about the robot. So let's go back to the mental models of the robot. The robot is generating new mental models sometime, sometimes. And other times, if it has a mental model that's already doing a pretty good job, it's just making modifications to that mental model. So at any point in time, the robot has a set of mental models, and it's throwing away the ones that are uh, have low scores. They, those mental models cannot reproduce the experiences of the physical robot. The ones that have relatively high scores, the, the robot keeps makes copies of those mental models and introduces slight changes to those copied mental models. In essence, what the robot is doing is evolving a population of mental models, like a population of organisms, where the fitness or the quality of each mental model in the population is its score. How well is it able to reproduce the experiences already experienced by the physical robot? Does that answer your question, Khan? Yes, thank you. Great, no problem. Okay, remember, it's okay if you don't remember the details of how the robot creates the mental model. What's important is why is it creating a mental model? 
It's creating a mental model because we're then going to give this robot a task and that task that task is to generate a gate or a way of moving. We put the physical robot on the left side of a table and we tell the physical robot we want you to figure out how to walk to the right side of the table. The table, the robot has never walked before. All it's ever done is lay flat and sort of stand up, right, or rotate or what have you. So before standing up and trying to walk, because the physical robot might fall off the table, it's a dangerous thing, instead of acting, the robot thinks instead. This is, we're looking inside the robot's head, and the robot has run a bunch of actions on the mental model and found this one. So you, you probably know from computer science, you can make a virtual machine inside of a physical machine. Same thing here with the robot. We have a physical robot and inside that physical robot is a virtual robot. The physical robot can run code on the virtual robot to see what happens. And it, in this case, the ro physical robot has already tried out lots of different kinds of code and it's found one piece of code, one set of commands that gets the virtual robot to walk from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. So at this point, the physical robot says, I got it. I have a prediction. I predict that this set of actions, I predict that this set of actions, if I try it out in reality, will cause me to walk from the left side of the table to the right side of the, to the, right side of the table. And in this case, it actually does. So what we have here is a robot that not only has taught itself to walk, but it taught itself to walk safely. This robot stood up and walked for the first time correctly without falling off the side of the, the table here. So this was a research project that I was involved with a, a while back, and this was particularly difficult. It took a lot of time to write the code and get the machine learning to work. First of all, to get the robot to teach itself its own mental model. And then step two, teach it, uh, get the robot to learn how to walk using its virtual uh, internal robot. Took us about three years to get this to work. You can imagine that we did thousands of attempts in which it did not work. Uh, we were in the lab late one night when we finally ran this code and captured this video. Myself and my two other collaborators that were working on this, we were so excited, started screaming and yelling. It was about three in the morning in the lab. There was an undergraduate that was sitting at another lab bench working on a completely different project, didn't know anything about this project. He turned around and he saw a robot moving and he said, dude, that's the evil starfish. So for better, for worse, that became uh, the nickname for, for this robot. So this is the, the evil starfish here. Okay, so again, that's a, that's a lot of ro robotics that's somewhat tangential to our discussion about uh, HCI. What I want you to take away from this is why mental models are useful. Okay. Okay, so back to humans and HCI. Um, how do we build up a mental model? Um, well, that's probably that the answer to that question is the one answer we do have about mental models. As you saw with the robot, you can sit and passively observe the world all you want, and you'll only make so much progress in creating a mental model. You need to act and see how the world pushes back. You remember our discussion about John Dewey at the beginning of this course. Uh, Dewey said over a hundred years ago, it is the action that is primary and the sensory result that is secondary. Okay, so we buy a brand new phone. We've had some phones before. We kind of know how they work, but this one's a little bit different. We want to build up a mental model of this phone. What can it do? What, what new function exists on this phone that didn't exist on my previous phone? I'm not going to bother reading the, the operating manual. I don't think people even write manuals anymore. This is a piece of tech. I can learn how it works by fidgeting with it. We place, the box, they, we place the phone inside this box and we act, which provides stimuli to the device and the device responds. What is this box, this figurative box that we're putting our device in? Again, cast your mind back to the, the beginning of the course. We wanna learn how this thing works 
So we're going to restrict the stimuli that we provide to the device and see what kind of response the device provides. What is this box? No? Again, going back to the beginning of the course, we talked about B.F. Skinner, uh, who is a very famous uh, uh, psychologist who or biologist who studied animal behavior. He built what became known as the Skinner box. We restrict all of the input to the animal, provide some stimuli to the animal like light or food, and we see how the animal responds. And that's our way of understanding or inferring what's going on inside the head of the, the animal. That for better or for worse, Skinnerian, uh, Skinnerian studies like this have led to us thinking about the brain as something that takes in sensory stimulation and produces a response. Whereas Dewey said it was the other way around. We act and see how the world responds. Okay. Regardless of who's right in this case, we want to learn our new phone, we provide it with a bunch of stimuli, and we observe the response. That's step one of starting to build up a mental model, our mental model of the device. I am building up a simulation of my phone in my head, and that simulation may initially be nothing more than a lookup table. I might observe that if I provide stimuli one to the phone, it gives me response one. If I provide stimuli two, I get response one, three, two, and, and so on. Um, when I was originally teaching my father how to use a word processor, he was definitely not a computer person. He hated computers with a passion, but he liked to write. And he and eventually gave up on his typewriter and moved to a word processor. It was an extremely difficult and painful experience. I'm sure many of you have tried to teach parents or grandparents to use computers. You know what I'm talking about. What I did uh, eventually was to write out a whole bunch of post-it notes where each post-it note had one stimuli and one response. If you want to print, click here, click there, click there, that's the stimuli, and then you should see your printer make a noise and spit out a piece of paper. That's the computer's response. If you want to spell check, do the, click this, you should see this. If you want this, click this, you should see that. By the end of the process, there were about a hundred post-it notes all over his office, and I thought we were we were all done. Um, but I would get the inevitable phone call uh, with my father being very frustrated because why? Why doesn't simply making a mental model, which is a set of lookup, which is basically a lookup table? What's the what's the limitation here? What's the drawback of rote? learning, just memorizing stimuli response pairs for a new piece of technology. It's not adaptable. So unbeknownst to my father or to us, um, our software downloads a new patch and now we start getting a different response to the same stimuli. Incredibly uh, frustrating, but okay. So we throw away the old post-it note and we replace it with a new post-it note that now corresponds to the new adaptation or the change caused by the software patch. What happens if I want to trigger, uh, what, what happens if I want to generate, uh, what happens if I want to elicit response three? If that's not on my father's list of post-it notes, he's got to call me and I have to create a new post-it note. So there is no way, so as Bryce is mentioning, um, it's not very adaptive and this particular kind of mental model is also not very generalizable. If I want to produce a new response, I don't know how to do it. So for most of us, as we're playing with our phone, we are at the beginning just observing sensory response pairs, but most of us eventually start to move to a more sophisticated mental model where we do some conceptual compression. We might notice patterns in the raw data, in the raw stimuli response uh, 
data set that we're generating, which is there's a set of stimuli that seem to produce the same or similar response, uh, response one, and there's another set of stimuli that tend to produce response two. So we might start to imagine our system is made up of two components, one that is supporting function one, and there are slightly different versions of function one, different stimuli um, result pairs, and another one where there is function two. So whether this is clear in your ASL system or not, by interacting with the system and just observing, uh, or just by putting their hand over the device in different ways, or hands over the device in different ways, and things flashing up on the screen, your users might come to recognize that they can either practice um, they can either practice digits where they are shown what the gesture is, so sort of a beginner level, or there's an advanced level that they can trigger with certain actions where they're just shown a digit and they have to remember what the gesture is that corresponds to that digit. That They, they might realize there's a beginner and advanced uh, uh, part of your system. Again, you may make you may put something on the screen to help them build up that mental model, but they might infer some of that just by interacting with the, the system. Okay, so we can then start to ask some questions, like if, as a user starts to build different kinds of mental models, how close is that mental model to the designer's conceptual model? What you had in mind when you were setting up your system? Did you eventually? Did you originally think of building in? Uh, a novice and advanced level and then you built those levels into the game and your users very quickly recognize that. Maybe you built in a beginning, intermediate and advanced mode, but by interacting with your system your user never actually unlocked the intermediate mode. They only ever stumbled over the novice and advanced mode. So their mental model is going to have two components. Yours has, has three. How close is the match? between your understanding of the, your system, which you should know pretty well, and the mental model formed by that user. What if a second user discovers the intermediate and advanced levels, but not the beginner level? Now we have two different users that have two different incorrect, or at least partial, mental models of your system. Okay. So again, drawback of road learning. First of all, there's a lot to memorize. And it's, it, it, this is not a good mental model for generating new predictions. If you do conceptual compression, you might be able to dream up a new action, a new way to stimulate the system that you haven't done yet, and you can form a prediction from this type of mental model about what's going to happen. And if you actually carry out that action, you can see whether your prediction was correct or not. Okay, so as mentioned, As we, are, uh, as we are interacting with this system, at, at all times we have these hypotheses. And hypothesis here is basically going to just serve as a synonym for mental model. Um, Khan was mentioning this idea of do we have multiple mental models. The answer is probably yes, although again we don't know really. Um, but it turns, but it, it seems likely that we have competing mental models that are not perfect and our brain is jumping between these mental models and trying to resolve which one is correct and maybe converging on the correct mental model. The best illustration for this is the Necker cube. If you've ever taken a psychology course, you've probably seen the Necker cube before. So I'm gonna ask you what seems like an odd question. Which square is closer to you? Obviously, you know, uh, you know rationally that neither square, neither the bottom left square or the top right square. Neither of them is closer to you, but if you listen to your brain, your brain will tell you otherwise. So I want you to, um, I'm, I'm going to stop talking in a moment. I want you to relax as best you can. Um, relax your eyes a little bit and just gaze at the Necker cube and think of this question that I've asked. Which square is closer to you? I'll give you a few seconds to think about that question.
Okay, so as you're gazing at the Necker cube, what is the experience that you had? What did your brain tell you, the non-rational part of your brain? The non-rational part of your brain is telling you that one of these squares actually is closer to you. Which, which one? So uh, Matthew says the front side of the cube is closer. So Matthew, you might notice that what you just said is a tautology, it's, re it's redundant. Which is the front side of the cube? The front by definition is closer to you, but which? The lower left or the upper right square? The lower left part. So for Khan, the lower left seems to be closer in the upper right, okay. Did everybody have the same experience? So Amanda said they switched depending on how I look. Sarah saw the top right, okay. So for most of you, if again, you can, you can, if you didn't have the experience that Amanda is mentioning, you can try this after class. If you gaze long enough at the ne Necker cube, Evan says the middle square. Ah, that's a great point. There's a middle, the middle square here. Yes, good, good point. For most people, they often see the lower left one as closer first. Remember that native English speakers tend to read from left to right. Turns out there's actually a cultural bias associated with the Necker cube also. But for most people, even if you do see the lower left square being closer, eventually the, your brain will switch and tell you that the upper right square is closer. If you keep looking, your brain might start to switch between these two. For a short period of time, you might see the lower left, and then for a short period of time, you might see the upper right, back to lower left, upper right, lower left, upper right, and so on. For those of you that did have the experience, like Amanda, of seeing the Necker cube switch, at what frequency was it shifting? Did you, did your brain interpret these two, did your brain see these two different uh, interpretations of the cube, and did it switch every millisecond, tenth of a second, every second, every two seconds, every five seconds? David says about from one to three seconds. Anybody else? Half a second. I think if we took a poll, and this has been done in larger groups, um, the average is about one second. It's kind of interesting. Uh, Julian says two seconds. So somewhere around, somewhere around a second. Why a second? Nobody knows. Turns out that there are certain processes in the brain that seem to oscillate at about one at a one second frequency, which is kind of interesting. Um, Priscilla says, uh, if he looks away and looks back, he defaults to the lower left. Exactly. Okay. Now um, we got two minutes left, so let's finish our discussion of the Necker cube, which is clearly fascinating. We can have a very long discussion about it. John Dewey said that we reach out in the world, we push against the world, we act first and then receive sensory, uh, a re a sensory repercussion. There seems to be no action when we're interacting with the Necker cube. You're not touching it. You're passively sitting back and letting the Necker cube fall on your retinas, right? What's the, what's the action here? Turns out there is an action. You are actively probing the Necker cube, not just thinking about it, you are taking action. What are those actions? As you are sitting quietly looking at the Necker cube, what actions, what muscle groups were you using? You were literally acting. You may not have noticed that you were doing it, but you were moving your eyes. There are muscles that control the direction in which your eyes point, and those muscles were working pretty hard during observation of the Necker cube. 
For most of you, you are probably saccading or moving your eyes to a particular corner of the Necker cube. And as you look at that corner, your, your visual field, although it may not feel like it is very narrow, you may only be seeing the three lines emanating from one of the corners of the Necker cube. Given that visual cube, your brain can see that there's a fuzzy version of a cube out there. So your brain makes a prediction and that prediction is if I saccade from this corner to this upper right corner, I expect that if I move my eyes to this position, I'm going to see this corner at this place in my visual field. If you do that with a real 3D cube and your eyes jump from here to here, that will confirm that you're looking at a cube with the lower left part of the square towards it. Or if you're looking from underneath the cube, then the upper right square upper right square is closer. However, the Necker cube is not drawn to perspective, right? It's not that the back or upper right square is smaller than the lower left square. So when your eyes jump up here, that prediction is slightly off. Where your eyes land, the corner is actually slightly out of position of where your brain predicted it would be. So your brain says, aha, well that, that foiled my prediction that if I move here I see this because I think lower left is closer. So maybe upper right is closer. I'm looking here, so now I think upper right is closer. I've changed my mental model. I'm now going to use that mental model and I predict that if I'm looking at a physical cube in which the upper right square is closer, I'm looking from underneath the cube. If that's true and I move my eyes to down here, I should see this corner in my visual field right here. So your eyes jump from here to here, and this corner is off. So your brain says, well, that was wrong. It's not that the upper right is closer to me. Maybe the lower left is closer. Your brain goes back to the original mental model. So all of the building blocks of building a mental model are at play here. Your, the Necker cube is designed to convince your brain of two potential interpretations of this. And your brain switches back between these two mental models. As it does, it is trying to generate actions. Your eyes are pushing against the Necker cube or different parts of the Necker cube to try and collect evidence for the current mental model. And when it does, when it moves to try and collect that evidence, the evidence it actually gets, your brain gets, is slightly wrong, so it discards that mental model and formulates or goes back to another one. That is why you get this feeling of your brain, of the Necker cube, switching between these two states. Okay, I apologize we ran a little bit over today. You have a quiz due to, to, tonight. Deliverable 7 is not due this Monday, it is due the following Monday. Uh, see you all back here Thursday morning. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks.